the immediate priority for the National Economic Council, for the White House, for the entire government is going to be um, the economic recovery. That whatever is done should not just last for one year. It should last as long as it's needed. Um, one of the lessons I take from the financial crisis was it's not just that you need a response to be large, you need a response to be long. Um, the CARES Act, for example, was very large, but it only lasted about four months. We need to make sure the next um, approach lasts as long as needed, including with triggers that link it to the unemployment rate as long as it's elevated. The United States has more fiscal capacity in 2021 than it had in 2009. Interest rates are much lower than they were in 2009. And as a result, interest on the debt is lower today than it's been for much of US history, most of post-war US history. And the real interest rate, the interest rate adjusted for inflation um, is actually negative. That means that the United States can borrow money and repay it with money that's even less valuable in the future. Uh, that gives an effectively unlimited amount of room to respond to the short-term problems with fiscal measures as much as is needed. The pandemic has really underscored the need to strengthen the safety net in order to mitigate the disproportionate harms of recessions on more vulnerable groups. So there is a, a growing body of evidence that shows that um, many of these programs represent crucial investments in people's future lives. Studies have documented, for example, that poor children exposed to Medicaid, food stamps, public housing, and high quality preschool experience more economic security as adults <laughs> decades later than they otherwise would. So all told, the evidence makes a powerful case for providing more support for programs that benefit poor children and their parents, not just because they relieve hardship in the moment, but because of their longer term benefits. And we should keep in mind that the benefits would accrue to more than those directly affected. These investments would create a more productive workforce, which means higher potential output and higher tax revenues, lower future spending on safety net programs and fewer funds directed towards crime prevention and incarceration. Protectionism is a bad industrial policy. So the problem with protectionism is it doesn't distinguish between reliable and unreliable sources of supply. It doesn't distinguish between uh, friendly allies and uh, nations that are potentially hostile to us. Uh, and when we impose tariffs or try to protect certain domestic industries ostens ostensibly on the ground of national security or public health, we end up alienating those precise, precisely those allies who we will need in a future uh, emergency. They tend to retaliate because they're uh, concerned about U.S. action, and that retaliation often hits U.S. manufacturers. When we think of something like the steel industry, a major manufacturing industry that the Trump administration has tried to help, protectionism has backfired in a way. It has helped create some jobs by imposing tariffs on imported steel. It has helped create some jobs in the steel industry. So one estimate says about 26,000, but the same study points out that more than 400,000 jobs in manufacturing have been lost in downstream steel using sectors. It's also led to the scramble for uh, exemptions from those tariffs. So that raises the, the issue of political favoritism. Who gets an exemption from the steel tariffs and who does not? It has also led to cascading uh, pr protection. When one industry is protected, gets high tariffs, then the downstream users also want high tariffs to compensate them for the higher costs. I think a policy of economic decoupling from China is likely to be a high cost, low benefit policy for the United States and a non-starter for US allies and partners. As I mentioned, China, given China's growing weight, I think other countries are unlikely to participate in a US led uh, decoupling strategy so decoupling is likely to look something like a unilateral U.S. decoupling from China, resulting in U.S. self-isolation from the most important source of global trade and economic uh, growth.